I'll, I'll do that right now. Okay. Uh, I want to welcome you to our April Lunch and Learn and um, let you know that in May, wow. we're gonna, in May, we're going to have two Lunch and Learn oh, wow. presentations. That looks One, very ugly. I mean, that, uh, who needs to mute? Okay. Uh, we're going to have two Lunch and Learns in May. One on May 6th and one on May 20th. Uh, they'll be publicized in this upcoming issue of The Voice and other places, but I just wanted to let you know. And um, as Michael was saying, this is kind of a difficult time in synagogue life. And one of those, and the, the April, the May 2nd Lunch and Learn is going to address um, uh, changes in synagogue life uh, at that time. So be on the lookout for that. But now today, um, we're delighted to have uh, Michael Colby with us. He has an encyclopedic, encyclopedic knowledge of the theater. Um, and this is a wonderful follow-up to Cantor Steve's presentations about uh, the Broadway musical through the decades. Uh, um, you wanted to say, or I'll just jump in, you tell me. Well, I, I, was, I also wanted to say a few words too. Yes, I want to have Wayne, I'm going to call on Wayne Senville to uh, introduce uh, his old classmate, Michael, and um, also to welcome all of the uh, former classmates of his that are tuning in today. So Wayne, take over. Okay, thanks, Judy. Uh, okay. So it's, it's a real privilege to be able to be introducing Michael, who, as you mentioned, was a friend and classmate a few years ago during high school. Uh, and didn't reconnect with Michael until a few years ago when another friend of ours, Sam Hagen, got us together for a lunch in Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, Michael was good enough to be able to join Cantor Steve during his series, uh, was it like um, two or three months ago on Broadway? And uh, I'm really glad that he uh, agreed to take the time to prepare a talk for us uh, today. So Michael's a musical theater historian and writer, but he's also worked as a school teacher. Uh, his own musicals have been performed off Broadway, regionally, and I believe even overseas, where I think I read that somewhere. And as, a, as an aside, I'd note that if any of you have any connections with our own lyric theater here in Vermont, alert them to Michael's musicals. Uh, Michael will be talking today about the state of musical theater, especially in light of COVID, what it takes to develop a new musical, and he'll also look back at some of the history and development of musicals. Uh, at the end of his talk, Michael promised me that he'll sing one of the numbers from the show Charlotte Sweet, which, for which he wrote the lyrics. Uh, Charlotte Sweet received three Drama Desk nominations, including one for Outstanding Lyrics. And I really don't know why it didn't win that. Because we opened in the shadow of a Little Shop of Horrors. Ah, OK. So, yeah, I noticed that was the winner. The uh, who lost uh, T.S. Eliot and I consoled each other. Yeah, Cats was up there, too. Pretty yeah. interesting company. Uh, so Michael's also the author of a fascinating book, which I read just not too long ago. Michael gave me a copy when we got together at, uh, for lunch. And it's really a fascinating book that I'd recommend to you all. And I'll put it in the chat box, a link to it. Uh, it's about the legendary Algonquin Hotel in New York that his grandparents owned and operated and lived in for many years. And one of the wonderful things about the book, especially if you're interested in theater or the many anecdotes that Michael relates uh, about Broadway legends who frequented the hotel. I lived there for a long time myself. That's why I didn't see you as much in Woodmere. <laughs> so uh, Michael said that his talk will be about 40 minutes or so, and he'll be pleased to respond to questions at the end of the talk. Okay. So thanks. Will, Will Cummins, the Avenue, and all that jazz. Today we'll discuss the future of the Broadway musical. 
Why is this Broadway season different from all other seasons? Well, COVID has subverted the cliche, the show must go on. But with spring in the air and vaccinations in the arm, I and my Broadway buds have every hope of a re-blossom time. Here's a video I co-wrote on the subject featuring Tony winners and Broadway veterans. See if you recognize them. I'm sure you've seen a lot of them in line order. They include Tony winner, uh, Judy Kay, Chuck Cooper. Um, we'll just watch. The Knights of Broadway, the lights of Broadway have never felt so far off. This lockdown drama has knocked down drama with every Broadway star off. But while it's not what anybody wants, from darkest days there, there comes a renaissance. The streets are quiet mostly, and no one's strolling closely. Though Schubert Alley's ghostly, the theater will survive. Come illness or rough tryout, reviews so bad you cry out, or buzz our biz will die out, the theater will survive. For laughs, for thrills, for tunes that we hum back. What else fulfills our love of live theater? Prepare for its comeback. So say whatever you will. This shy left in our jewel. And time for its renewal. The theater will survive. Can you hear such clapping while in such a vibrant room? Or show-stopping songs and tapping, not Facebook or Zoom. It's something a form of our beats, excitement that's next to none. You're part of a thousand heartbeats, responding as one. It's flourished since the great times, console. Through cold and bleak times, these months are not unique times. We walk through storms and thrive. Some say we late, these may be our last days. I can't predict, the show must go on as resilient as past days. No murders made us wary, like spiders. virus no setback will retire us our stage lights still inspire us the theater will survive through strike through snow through Some good voices there. Uh, probably you've seen a number of them on Law and Order. Um, we uh, launched that video uh, with a, um, a, a special 90 minute show that um, featured a lot of those performers talking about what they were going through. Um, and um, if, well, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but let's get to the main show here. Here we go. 
the what to know business of show business. How new musicals are developed today. Here is again the, uh, uh, the video um, that um, can be acquired on Vimeo, but let's move on. Okay. The theater is dying. The theater is dying. The theater is practically dead. But actors keep acting and plays keep attracting and year after year, there is something to cheer. Thus wrote Oscar Hammerstein, the second in 1953. This lyric is from the song Intermission Talk uh, featured in the musical Me and Juliet. Even further back in 1938, George S. Kaufman and Moss Hart penned a play whose title became synonymous with the theater. The Fabulous Invalid. Time and again, reports on the demise of the theater have been trumpeted only to be drummed out by the basic need for the magical alchemy of live performance. This dates back to the rituals and ceremonies of ancient times evolving into the wide world of live entertainment. But nothing in recent times has challenged theater's existence quite like COVID-19. That's why composer Ned Paul Ginsberg and I created the music video you just saw to raise money for the Actors Fund. Still, as historians will point out, after the darkest recesses of the Middle Ages, including the bubonic plague, there rose a great renaissance. Though on hold right now, the theater is expected to make a gradual comeback starting in the fall of, 19, of 2021. Tina Hora. But there are other <laughs> problems. The, uh, the economics of theater uh, have just spiraled so that shows are becoming more and more uh, costly and tickets crazy. Here is some lost money. Of course, some didn't. Um, a typical Broadway budget for uh, a musical is upwards of eight to 14 million. Even an off-Broadway musical can cost two million nowadays. Reportedly, the first musical to lose more than a million was The Happy Time in 1968, and that won three Tonys, including it for its star, Robert Goulet. The musical version of King Kong required 36.5 million. When it lost the whole shebang, its backers went ape. The musical of Spider-Man lost even more, reportedly 75 million. Even an average size musical like The Prom came in at 13.5 million and lost it, though it may met, it probably made something back in the uh, television version. And ticket prices are no giveaway either, topping $175 for Broadway hits to uh, $1,150 for premium, premium seats to Hamilton. It can be cheaper paying for a bar mitzvah. So times certainly have changed. Uh, in 1951, the year I was born, um, an extravagant production of The King and I cost a quarter of a million to produce, more than any previous Rodgers and Hammerstein show up to that point. Uh, it could cost 40 times that today. Um, by 1956, when I saw my first Broadway musical, tickets were between $2.30 for balcony and $4.90 for orchestra. Today, that might not pay for an intermission soda. And uh, these are some of the shows that I grew up with. Um, to the late 1960s, I could see shows like Sondheim's Company and Follies for as low as $2.00. That wouldn't co cover taxes today. Uh, Babes in Arms in um, 1937, you could get tickets for $1 and, and $2. You could see Sweet Charity on twofers for $3. Um, um, Les Miserables more recently cost $30. Um, and here are some of the shows that I got to see for a top of 990 in the 60s and 70s. 
Um, Gypsy with Ethel Merman, Bye Bye Birdie, Cheetah Rivera, Dick Van Dyke, Hello Dolly, Ch Carol Channing, Zero Mostel, Fiddler on the Roof, Cabaret with Joel Gray and Jack Guilford, Hair with a lot of hair. And uh, finally, uh, 1776 uh, with uh, Ken, uh, with, um, with, with um, William Daniels um, and uh, Ken Howard. I don't know if that section is being blocked. I hope not. I think you could probably shrink um, the uh, panel of, uh, of, of, of watchers. Uh, I, that may affect some other slides. Anyway, let's move on. The traditional out of town tryout was transformed. Uh, the traditional out of town tryout, which transformed troubled shows like Hello Dolly uh, and Fiddler into smash hits, became rarer as production uh, costs uh, near prohibitive price tags edging toward a million dollars. Um, but um, the out of town um, tryouts did continue, but not many anymore. Um, but they were needed in its Detroit tryout. Fiddler was so shaky on the roof, Variety predicted it would have a moderate run at best. Wrong. Besides out of town, more economical venues became standard. These venues included regional and resident theaters where expenses were fewer and subscription audiences were certain to attend. I was a founding member of another such source, the first nonprofit company off, off Broadway exclusively for the development of new musicals. It was called the Stewart Musical Theater Lab at St. Clement's Church, which is still there um, on West 46th Street. Um, uh, these venues, in, oh, uh, incidentally, um, St. Clement's was also the home to Off Broadway, um, uh, Off Broadway's American Place Theater, where Faye Dunaway first drew attention in the play Hogan's Goat, and Dustin Hoffman made waves in Murray Schiskel's Eh. Yeah, that was the title, Eh. You could tell it was by a Jewish playwright. Here are some Broadway hits. Um, that uh, developed through regional um, and nonprofit um, situations. All of them won the Tony their year. To General Verona, Raisin, A Chorus Line, Annie, of which I'll tell you some more insights uh, shortly. Um, and uh, Ain't Miss Be. Oh, well, well, you'll, you'll hear why those people are popping up soon. Um, and then there was Ain't Miss Behaven my favorite review of all time. Um, in 1972, the Tony went to Two Gentlemen of Verona, developed by Joseph Papp, Shakespeare in the Park. In 1974, the best musical was Raisin, developed at the Arena Stage in Washington, DC. In 1976, it was a chorus line, developed by New York's Public Theater by Joseph Papp. In 1977, it was Annie, developed at Goodspeed Opera House in Connecticut. In 1978, it was Ain't Misbehaving, created at Off Off Broadway's Manhattan Theater Club. Most of these musicals moved to Broadway right after inexpensive and acclaimed productions, except for Annie. Annie, which received negative reviews during its triad at Goodspeed, seemed destined for oblivion. Now look at the fourth column and I'll have some uh, some tidbits about people involved in Annie. It was Mike Nichols who saved little Annie. He saw the last performance at Goodspeed and decided to produce it with a few changes. The original Annie, Kristen Vigard, had been replaced by another child in the cast, Andrea McArdle. Nichols then recast Miss Hannigan, the show's villainess, with Dorothy Loudon, who would one day win a Tony for it advancing to Broadway with most of the Goodspeed cast. I was a friend of Goodspeed's original Miss Hannigan, the late replaced Maggie Task, who'd been directed to play it seriously, not funny, and was miffed uh, when she got stiffed. But as so often happens in a new musical, those are the breaks as flukes of fate turn 
to an ungainly duckling into an enchanting swan. Now a little bit more about St. Clemens and uh, you will see um, its producer, Stuart Ostrow, who used funds from some of his hits, hits like 1776 in Pippin uh, to develop the, um, the musicals there. The Musical Theater Lab began in 1974 with the original workshop of The Robber Bridegroom, a musical based on Eudora Welty's novella. Talk about flukes of fate. The writers of this musical, Alfred Urey and Robert Waldman, had just about given up on theater after disappointments, like their first Broadway show closing on opening night. But their agent, Flora Roberts, had clout. She was also the agent of Stephen Sondheim. She contacted Stuart Ostrow and fervently recommended The Rubber Bridegroom. And it's a good thing. Here is one of the authors, Alfred Urey, with his Tony. Uh, it's a good thing um, because Alfred Urey might never have gone on to win the Oscar and Pulitzer Prize for writing Driving Miss Daisy plus Tony Awards for other shows. I will talk a little bit more about The Robber Bridegroom, which was probably the first uh, musical developed in a non-profit uh, situation as part of a program. Uh, you see the Broadway cast, you see the touring company, um, you see the uh, program, then it was revised successfully at the Roundabout Theater off-Broadway. So um, the Musical Lab um, workshop would cost a few few thousand dollars as opposed to a million, with actors being paid only transportation fees for subway tokens. I was the production assistant in this, my first professional job. The experience was well worth the fact that I too wasn't being paid. And yet hundreds of actors auditioned at the prospect of helping to create new musicals as shepherded by Broadway heavyweights like Stuart Ostrow. Among those auditioning were newcomers like Kevin Klein, who at first was turned down for being too stiff. This was likely a time, this was likewise a time of transition for Broadway veterans, facing slow years after decades of going from paying job to paying job. I remember Sidney Armis, who'd been in South Pacific, Mr. Roberts, and most famously in Wish You Were Here, in which he sang and played Don Jose of Far Rock Away. He was among those who, upon hearing of our salary, almost went bonkers. Our final cast top-lined Raul Julia, you see him in the left corner, at uh, virtually no cost, and other musical theater labs would feature the likes of Victor Garber, after uh, we had three weeks of rehearsals, half of which focused on an elaborate opening number that after our first public performance was the first thing we cut. Um, you'll see in the left hand corner what the final opening number was. Uh, we worked with such minimal funding, I brought in my own typewriter when we still use typewriters for Alfred Urey to do his rewrites. We had a mere week of performances, but the audiences were studied with Broadway notables attending free of charge, which is why the actors didn't get paid either. Then, lo and behold, the show came delightfully together. The creators, Yuri and Wallman and directors, Gerald Freeman had triumphed, except for one detail, no offer to move the show. Fate stepped in again when on the last performance. The Robber Bridegroom was seen by Oscar winner John Hausman, who also ran Juilliard's acting company, which toured. Hausman loved it, optioned it for a national tour with uh, acting company members Patti Lapone and the now less stiff Kevin Klein. And in fact, um, that was when Klein and Patti Lapone got their first major attention on Broadway. The show played Broadway twice, once with the acting company and once for an extended run with many of the workshop cast. Then the Roundabout Theater revived it in 216. On the bottom, in the middle, he with cast member Ernie Sabella, who was the voice of Pumbaa in The Lion King, 
and Stephanie uh, Copeland, who was the uh, second in command and taught me all the ropes. You see Stephanie uh, again uh, in the far right. She's with Rhonda Coulet, who was the original leading lady. You see her um, in the uh, left-hand side uh, with the uh, opening uh, number. Uh, Barry Bostwick, whom um, was the original choice, but wasn't available and Ralph Julia replaced him. Barry Bostwick won the Tony Award. And in the middle of Stephanie and Rhonda Coulet, you see a proud Alfred Urey. And another trend that uh, took form were jukebox musicals. Off off Broadway and uh, workshops and showcases proliferating, uh, most notably launched a chorus line in Little Shop of Horrors, and then came Ain't Misbehaving, based on songs by Fats Waller. It not only started off off Broadway, it not only started off off Broadway, but epitomized a growing trend in musicals, the jukebox musicals. Here are some others: Jersey Boys, Beautiful. Uh, the Sheer Show, and Mamma Mia. These could be musical reviews or musicals with plot, built around songs made famous by songwriters and or performers. Add to this category, um, Jersey Boys, using hit songs of the Four Seasons, beautiful, telling the life and songs of Carole King, The Sheer Show, and Mamma Mia, based on ABBA, the singing group, not the Hebrew name for father. Another trend that exploded during the 1970s, then the 1980s, was imports of foreign hits. They had a distinct advantage over American musicals. They'd already succeeded in other countries. Of course, there had been prior hit imports like Oliver from England and Irma La Duce from France, but now uh, the Britain, uh, songwriters, the British songwriters like Andrew Lloyd Webber began dominating Broadway with what we call poperas. They were um, pop sounding operas. In other words, they were all sun uh, versions of uh, stories. Um, and here you have some of the others, Jesus Christ Superstar, Cats and Evita, and not written by Andrew Lloyd Webber, the French Les Miserables. At last, producer, um, at last, producer Harold Prince would no longer worry uh, about the increasing hurdle of capitalization when such Prince classics as Sweeney Todd and Follies lost most of their investment. Instead, he let British impresario Cameron McIntosh do the producing while Prince just directed huge money makers like Avita and the Phantom of the Opera. They were launched in London at lesser costs then took Broadway by storm. Unfortunately, as these trends grew, American born musicals decreased in number, especially plotted musicals, ex except for revivals like No No Nanette, uh, Showboat and Peter Pan or shows adopted from movies with bankable names like 42nd Street and La Cage of Fall. Meanwhile, another breeding ground for musicals was Off Off Broadway, where some musicals went from Off Off Broadway to uh, Off Broadway, and some went to Broadway, and some just didn't go. Uh, here are examples. Little Shop of Horrors, Falsettos, um, Charlotte Sweet, Runaways, UB, Rent, A Chorus Line, and um, Living Dolls and uh, Dementos. Um, Mark Shaman, actually these spaces were springboards for small musicals and young musical theater writers. For example, Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman who one day musicalized Hairspray and Mary Poppins started off off Broadway with the rock and roll style uh, Living Dolls and Dementos which you see in the top right corner. Now, let me tell you about my own experience. Oh, we forgot one, once on this island. And now I'll tell you about my own experiences. Um, off Off Broadway. Off Off Broadway shows could be done in tandem with 
nonprofit theaters. It was possible then uh, to give a tax deductible donation to cover most of the expenses, especially if you were if you knew where to cut corners. Um, it was a time when in their early careers, future Tony and Oscar winners would audition for my shows. Uh, you see there Faith Prince who won the Tony for Guys and Dolls um, and uh, Victoria Clark who won for uh, Light in the Piazza and J.K. Simmons who won the Oscar for Whiplash. Another one I wore, oh, these are scenes from our rehearsals at the Algonquin. Um, Kristen Chenoweth, whom you see, uh, flew in from, oh, Kristen flew in from Texas uh, to do a reading for me. Some of them made it big, some of them didn't, but all were willing to work for peanuts and subway costs back then. A time when even Stephen Sondheim shows were finding it harder and harder to get to, to get the capitalization to move to a commercial run. So Sondheim shows went to a bunch of regional and um, uh, and um, other nonprofit theaters. Uh, Sweeney Todd had skipped out going out of town and worked out its kinks through extended previews on Broadway, but um, going other routes were Sunday in the Park with George, Assassins, and Into the Woods, which were developed at Off-Broadway and regional theaters such as Playwrights Horizons and Old Globe Theater in San Diego, which are still there. And uh, hopefully will return when uh, the uh, pandemic is over. And uh, Sweeney Todd was a perfect of this, the trend uh, in musicals taking on new and bold topics. Um, there had been past examples like Carousel, which depicted to domestic abuse, as well as South Pacific dealing with racial prejudice, but now daring musicals were everywhere. Fiddler evoked the pogroms, cabaret, Nazi Germany, gay storylines appeared in La Caja Fall, Falsettos, up to Funhouse and the prom. And uh, before it became a catchphrase, let me move that back. Before it became a catchphrase, catchphrase, um, Black Lives Matter uh, was a theme of such shows as Raisin, Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope, uh, The Color of Purple, and The Scottsboro uh, Boys. Human loss and mental illness became the theme of um, the Pulitzer Prize winning Next to Normal. Now, Zero in on 1988. By then, the long running of Chorus Line was joined by imported blockbusters like Cats, Phantom, and Les Miserables. American hits like La Cajo Fall, Dreamgirls, Nine, and Into the Woods had long but not marathon runs. Then, starting with Rent in 1996, there was one blockbuster after another, making enormous profits. Rent, which began off off Broadway theater workshop uh, grossed over $280 million. Here are some other ones. The Producers, Hairspray, Book of Mormon, Wicked, and of course, Hamilton. Um, unfortunately, the demand for tickets to these shows had two negative aspects. For a range of reasons, Ticket and production costs inflated well beyond the ratio of the national economy. Secondly, this resulted in audiences being select, more selective on shows one could afford, with fewer musicals being produced and even fewer forums for new writing talents. Yes, making a living in theater became more like fantasy land. As a proof of the spiraling cost, just look at old and recent and more recent um, uh, playbills. Here you'll see one for Fiddler on the Roof and one for the prom. Notice the difference in how many producers it took. Where it used to take one producer like Harold Prince or Dave, Joseph Papp or David Merrick, uh, Fiddler on the Roof 
while that one just took Harold Prince in 1964, uh, the prom took in 2018 more than 50 producers. And then there's Disney. Disney was taking over Broadway. Disney productions supplanted the old method of developing musicals from scratch by launching, uh, by launching and developing uh, theatrical equivalents of, 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 of uh, Disney hit movies. These money machines began with Beauty and the Beast in 1944, but reached unparalleled financial heights with The Lion King, which I believe is the largest grossing show of all time. Also, the content of musicals changed. If your favorite kind of musical was a traditional one uh, with a full non-synthesized orchestra, you'd more likely be satisfied by revival like uh, Lincoln Center's uh, The King and I, My Fair Lady in South Pacific. Uh, by contrast, look at the Tony nominees in um, 2010. You won't find anything like Hello Dolly or Funny Girl or Kiss Me Kate uh, in this batch. Um, the best musical nominees uh, were, uh, oh, the best, the, the best musical nominees were uh, Memphis with its Motown sound, American Idiot, Rock, Fila, Afrobeat, and Million Dollar Quartet, Rock and Roll. Flash forward. Yes, there are Tony nominations for shows that opened in 2020, even if they've closed. They will not be awarded until COVID ends and hopefully these shows all reopen. We're not sure of that. Um, the best musical uh, are Jagged Little Pill, a book musical built around the songs of Alanis Morissette, Tina, another jukebox musical presenting the life and songs of Tina Turner and Moulin Rouge based on the film, which itself was a ju jukebox musical of popular, mostly contemporary songs. So nowadays, where does this leave original musicals and new songwriters of the genre? I mean, after all, during the 1920s, you'd get new shows almost every other year written by the likes of Gershwin, uh, Cole Porter, Irving Berlin, Rodgers and Hart. During the 50s, there were Rodgers and Hammerstein, Frank Lesser, Lerner and Lowe, and Julie Steins. From the 60s on, Jerry Herman, Bach and Harnick, Kander and Ebb, and so forth. By the way, most of them were Jewish. And uh, here's a uh, list of Jewish uh, Broadway songwriters. Irving Berlin, Annie Get Your Gun, The Gershwins, Porgy and Bess, uh, Jerome Kern, Showboat, Rogers and Hart, Babes in Arms, E.Y. Harburg, uh, the, the, the Wizard of Oz, um, Leonard Bernstein on uh, West Side Story, ha Harold Rome, um, Wish You Were Here, uh, Alan J. Lerner, My Fair Lady, Burton Lane, Finian's Rainbow, Bob Merrill, uh, Carnival, and here are some more of Broadway's Jewish songwriters. Frank Lesser, Guys and Dolls, Julie Stein, Gypsy and Funny Girl, Adolph Green and Betty Comden uh, on the 20th century, Sheldon Harnick and Jerry Bach, Who on the Roof, Charles Strauss, Bye Bye Birdie, Cy Coleman, uh, Barnum, Stephen Schwartz, I'm sure you can think of many, John Kander and Fred Ebb, Cabaret, Chicago, William Finn, Falsettos, uh, Stephen Schwartz, Godspell, and uh, finally, Jonathan Larson, Rent. So nowadays, uh, there are still several recent songwriter successes of all back backgrounds. Here some of them are. And those are their shows. So you have uh, Shirley Stephen Sondheim is still popular with Wicket, uh, Lynn Manuel with Hamilton. Then there's Robert Lopez of Avenue and Q and Book of Mormon, Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty of Ragtime and Ben Pasek 
and Justin Paul of Dear Evan Hansen. But there are dozens of other accomplished writers who don't have the opportunities they might in past days. Sit still since way back when, so much of Broadway fortune is luck that many writers may quit. Even the young Richard Rogers, desperate for his first break, was about to ditch show business and go into the ladies' underwear business instead. But uh, this is what a budget would be nowadays. Actually, probably a little bit more. But we still say the theater will survive. Look at this budget. Uh, pretty overwhelming. One would hope that after the pandemic, the uh, economics of theater will return to the more affordable, at least until times return to normalcy. Certainly it will be a gradual process. At first, audiences will wear masks and follow other protocol. There's the need to install ventilation and other safety precautions. On the other hand, the size of both shows and audiences will be limited. Regular theater go goers once were largely drawn from the tri-state area, but that changed as ticket costs increased and less expensive intermediate took hold. To fill theater seats, there was more of a dependency on tourists, which will no longer be the case until travel and tourism build back, which may take some time. That's why for a while, larger scale shows may have to offer more for audience friendly prices and theater unions may reduce salaries and other weekly expenses, but we don't know. Time will tell. I'll be happy, happy to elaborate on particulars in Q&A. Um, and let's go back to the theater will survive. As I said, um, our all-star cast made the video, which uh, is 90 minutes and can be um, acquired on uh, Vimeo uh, on demand. And we had extra um, special guests like um, Ben Vereen and uh, the original Sweeney Todd, Len Carrier. Um, but now, just before q and I thought you might enjoy a video of me performing from the show Charlotte Sweet, which takes place in the Victorian Music Hall. This number is in the tradition of double entendre patters, patter songs. So let me get it going. Oh, I guess I will have to get out of this. Thank you for your patience. It'll just be another minute. Here we go. I think I mentioned to you that uh, all the uh, scenes where uh, Dustin Hoffman was auditioning uh, off Broadway in the movie, um, uh, uh, Tootsie were shot at the shot in the uh, with the backdrop being the uh, scenes. <laughs> Wife and I have a vegetable love, so she'll cook and fry every time for me the dove. Her dish is hot and cool, tempt me like a fool. Till I get them, I grow edgy, so I'm nicknamed a veggie. Reggie, I can not imagine how peas are as creamy as her cow peas. Her asparagus has tantalizing tips, and her jumbo cauliflowers have me gobbling for hours. That is why I'm known as Vegetable Reggie. How I relish her sweet pickle on the side with pumpernickel. I religiously adore her parsnips. And it's vegetably valid when I'm tossing up the salad. That is why I'm known as Vegetable Reggie. Oh, I love a dipping in her parsley, though she serves it to me sparsely. And her big potatoes have appealing chips. While her onions and her scallions have the force of ten battalions. That is why I groan as Vegetable Reggie. 
Now you will see how fast am I, practically unsurpassed am I. I can not imagine how bizarre is creamy as a cow, as her asparagus, as tantalizing tips. And your jumbo cauliflowers has me gobbling for hours, that is why I'm in his vegetable regime. How I wear a so sweet pickle on the side with pop and nickel, I religiously adore pots and nibs. And it's vegetable valid when I'm tossing up a salad, that is why I'm in his vegetable regime. I love a dipping in a party, don't you sense the sauce, the yellow beef potatoes have appealing chips. But I'm serious, can you tell the force of tin Italians, that is why I'm in his vegetable Okay, we're back. Thank you. I uh, apologize for a few of the fumbles, but um, I want to, in the meantime, I want to uh, mention, I don't know if I got this information uh, uh, spoken about um, the um, scenery from Charlotte Sweet was why Justin Hoffman appeared because um, he was, um, uh, he auditioned in Tootsie two scenes that um, had the Charlotte Sweet um, uh, scenery as its backdrop. I want to thank um, all the people who have asked me here and helped Wayne Senville, uh, uh, Cantor Zeidenberg, Julie Hirschberg, Sarah Glassman, and uh, Synagogue or Hobby Zedek or Zedek. Whatever, Zedek. <laughs> my, my, Michael, can you can you just before we get to Q and A, can you just tell us a little bit about Charlotte Sweet and put some context on the song? So, oh, I thought I did. Well, oh, okay. Um, it, it took, you, Charlotte Sweet was um and it, uh, it took place in a uh, Victorian music hall uh, where uh, all the uh, the, the uh, leads had freak voices, and one was uh, the person you just saw. Well, what was um, Vegetable Reggie, who um, uh, did uh, naughty patter songs and had the fastest voice. Other people had the highest voice, the lowest voice, a schizophrenic who duetted with herself and so forth. And the uh, the original um, Harry, uh, Michael McCormick, who uh, uh, video of The Theater Will Survive, um, he, first of all, he went to Northwestern with me and we became lifetime buddies and um, he's, when, when it reopens, he is the current um, uh, Wizard of Oz in Wicked. And two of the other people, um, Jason Gra and, um, uh, well, well, two of the other people in the video um, also were um, uh, played the Wicked, Eddie Corbett and Jason Gra. Uh, and I mean, I, I've just had a lot of uh, crossovers with these people, like you saw, um, Andrew McArdle's picture earlier and last last summer or summer ago she did a show for me in which she played um, uh, a senior citizen and truth be told little Annie is now a grandmother in real yeah. life so more questions please Steve unmute so Michael I just want to thank you as well for <laughs> The, the stories you bring and the, the, even the songs that you presented um, really a gift for us today. And we don't very often have a chance to hear from a, a live Broadway composer, lyricist, um, lyricist, right? Um, but uh, it's really a gift. And I wanted to ask you about just your process around as a lyricist um, working with other composers. Can you just describe, I know each process is different, but how do you how do you um, collaborate with your composer? What does the process look like? Um, do you usually come up with lyrics and send it to your composers or do you, does your composer start off with the music and send it to you? Uh, well, Richard Rogers said, first comes the phone call. Um, um, and um, um, oh, one, someone else said, um, first comes the check. But um, in my case, I do it both ways. I've written entire, Sammy Khan was the other one. Um, I've written entire um, books and lyrics um, before a composer set a uh, note to it. I've also um, uh, been given shows that um, were already written and overhauled them with my own lyrics. So it's, it's both processes. I, I mean, um, when um, Richard Rogers wrote with, um, 
uh, Larry Hart, um, often uh, the music came first, but not always. And when Oscar Hammerstein wrote with Jerome Kern, um, the uh, music came first. When um, Richard Rogers wrote with Oscar Hammerstein, the lyrics came first. And it's just very, it varies. Um, it all depends on the situation. I mean, I've written entire libretti, uh, the whole show. Uh, and in, in, in fact, when I wrote Charlotte's Suite, the composer, Jerry Marco, uh, got annoyed because I'd, he'd had to set all the, uh, uh, the lyrics to music. And he said, can't you give me a break and, and just one of the songs from, um, from my trunk of uh, old melodies? And I did exactly that. And um, he came back, it was called Bubbles of Me Bonnet. And he came back to me and he said, you know, I had no trouble setting any of the lyrics, but this Bubbles of Me Bonnet, I can't figure out what to do. And I said, Jerry, I wrote it to your tune as you asked. Okay. So there's a question from Jeff. Do you want to unmute and ask? Yes. I'm um, wondering if you have any advice on developing new musicals. I've currently got one that I wrote the book Music and Lyrics for. It's in its third stage reading now. Um, you've gone into great detail about how difficult it is, and I know that the... It is. I, um, yeah. do you, Twice as hard. Yeah. Um, well, my advice is... Um, First of all, see as many shows. I'm sure you've seen a lot of shows and listened to it and you assimilate the style. Um, then um, it's good to network. Um, and you may even, and, and find people who would be interested in do, doing it for less money. I, I mean, to be honest, I had doors closed left and right. And then I had to, um, uh, raise the money for uh, my first shows like uh, Charlotte Sweet myself. And then other doors opened. But I have to say I was happiest with the productions when I um, supervised and co-produced them myself. Um, but I, I mean, back to the days of the Robert Bridegroom, we were doing shows for a couple of thousand to nothing and actors were coming and uh, do it um, for very little. Now, I think even for a reading, Actors Equity is asking for like 200 to $300 to pay equity uh, members. So, um, and then uh, one of them, I led the lad, um, which was a Christmas musical. I have Jewish music as well, but um, we did that um, entirely as a, a concert. And the actors went around with their scripts like they were carolers and it was all sung and all rhymed. So uh, we did, didn't have to get the uh, permission from Actors' Equity. We did it as a reading and it was the most elaborate reading you've ever seen. So you have to be innovative and um, patient and have always have a backup plan as far as making a living. I can't say that I've ever really made a substantial living. I've gotten royalties, some of my shows have been optioned, but I do it for the love more than anything else. Yeah, I'm not worried about making money from it. I'm just trying to get it produced somewhere and hoping to follow the rules that they say in the producers. Where do you live? Huh. Jersey City. Okay, I mean, I'm in Jersey too. Oh, okay. So try to get involved with if and when they reopen either Jersey theaters, of which there's some good ones that make yeah. it reading. Okay, or, or New York. Okay, thanks. Other, uh, other questions? Well, I, I've got one question myself, Michael. I mean, I wasn't clear from your presentation whether overall you're optimistic or pessimistic about the future for, uh, for okay. musicals. Um, I think Based, as, as my uh, video suggests, I will always love and try to work in the theater. Um, it's anybody's guess how timetable will be on theater re returning back to normal. Uh, I mean, there are people making plans for the fall. I'm making plans for the fall. And um, it's, you I mean, 
they really have to be madly in love with the theater because there's so much um, frustration and rejection. And um, I don't know anyone in the theater that I work with, except for a few lucky ones who, who just lucked out. Um, but I don't know anyone who has had consistent, um, a consistent sort, source of income from the theater. Um, you, you, um, I mean, Robert Anderson, um, who wrote Tea and Sympathy and other plays said, you can make a killing, but not necessarily a living. And uh, so again, um, I, I know there are a lot of actors who hope to go to California and get a TV pilot, which allows people like um, uh, like 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 Hall, like 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 um, Hal Linden and um, and and um, Valerie Harper and others to return to Broadway mm -hmm. because they knew that their money was coming. I have a mm -hmm. friend, um, a very close friend named Lori Tan Chin, um, who struggled for years, um, and now she's on um, uh, Dora from Queens in the second lead role, and. She finally can move to a new apartment. Oh. Been doing it for years, and um, I remember sitting with Kristen Chenoweth uh, when she did *Love the Lad* and her worrying that no one would hire her again. She had been in Texas and they did a production of uh, of *Whoopi*, and she was hoping to get hired. And they went with someone who was living in in, in Texas. Uh, uh, Kristen was from Texas, but she had moved to New York. And of course, she did all right for herself. And uh, I remember getting a phone call from uh, Nathan Lane when he was just starting. And he said, and he was desperate to work and was willing to talk about doing a reading. And it's just a very contradictory uh, business. Some people do very well. Some people do other things so that they can go back to it. Anyone else have a question of Michael? I mean, Faith Prince, one of the flukes is that um, Faith Prince um, was supposed to be cast in Little Shop of Horrors, the original version, oh. instead of Ellen Green, but she got another job. So, she, so Ellen Green went in. And um, there are stories like um, Michael Nouri was supposed to be in on the 20th century, but he got another show where he played the lead. So they had to settle for Kevin Klein, and Kevin Klein made even a bigger hit than the Rubber Bridegroom, and got a Tony Award for on the 20th century. Uh, a thousand stories like this on the Great White Way. Right. Oh. Anything else? I mean, even I have done jobs to, to get <laughs> by. Uh, I've been a uh, an office temp. I've, I've sold knives, <laughs> and uh, but I also was very lucky that um, I had the Algonquin, uh, which uh, was a place where we rehearsed. Um, there was a space there called the Annex, uh, which rumor hath it during the uh, Roaring Twenties was a speakeasy, speakeasy, but it became a storage place, and we cleared it out. And then I'd have um, actors coming for rehearsals. Uh, we, we served lunch, we served um, really n nicely uh, done lunches. And suddenly I would see Broadway actors who weren't in my show suddenly showing up for lunch. And, um, uh, and it was just amazing who would come through those doors to audition. Uh, Judy Alexander. Uh, yeah, hi, Michael. So nice to see you. I read your book. I loved it. And, you know, I, I just, you know, love everything about. Uh... To, uh, to these, sometimes I get them mixed up. Thank you, Judy Hirschberg. And now to Judy Alexander. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, just like the uh, Algonquin no longer exists or that world, and, you know, you pointed out uh, how many producers it now takes to put on a Broadway musical. Um, and how difficult it is for a lyricist and composer to get work anymore. 
where where do those people go if they do want to write musicals? And you know, do you see Broadway getting to the point where people say enough is enough? We're just we just are not going to spend two thousand dollars for a seat and you know go back to a little bit more <laughs> affordable stuff for normal people. Um, well, um, the Algonquin Kids people around. It's just. Uh, been refurbished. Uh, yeah, but I'm talking about, you know, the Algonquin, you know. You're... Yes, it had a famous cabaret room called the Oak Room, um, and that closed down, and it was a launching pad for people like uh, Michael Feinstein and um, Harry Connick. As far as what people do, um, I'll give you an example. Um, there's, uh, um, there's Martin Alfman, and David Crane, um, who were trying to get musicals on. They did a show called Personals, uh, which ran a little bit off Broadway. And then they had a musical version of Arthur and they thought they had it made. And that went to the Great Speed Opera House and didn't get anywhere. So they couldn't take it anywhere anymore. They flew to California and they created Friends. And they've done all right since then and never <laughs> looked back. Uh, there was a, uh, a lyricist named Bruce Geller who wrote with one of my uh, collaborators, Jack Bont, And they had a couple of off-Broadway shows, one that ran for a while, but they really didn't make money. So um, what Bruce Geller did was he flew to California and he created Mannix and Mission Impossible. And he made a great living but he was um, killed in a plane crash. So uh, you never know where your life is headed. headed. Um, and when um, Dale Wasserman, who wrote Man of La Mancha, tested off another show that he wrote with, uh, with um, Bruce Geller and Jack Herbont, it was called Living the Life. Um, they asked me in to replace Bruce Geller. And um, that show was done out. Uh, in um, where everyone wants to get their show done, Dubuque, Illinois. And uh, Dale Wasserman retitled it, to a, gave it a title that was one word off from a Broadway smash. Instead of Big River, he called it Great Big River. And um, so those are the breaks, them's the breaks, and you either put up with it because there's just no other alternative for you uh, and you learn to, and I, as far as what I have done, I have kept in circulation. I have been very good to uh, the theater people that I, I work with in my showcases. I, for a while, I, I, I relied on um, uh, raising money myself and uh, they became, um, they, the, the money was put into not for profit, um, off off Broadway theaters and um, it, almost every one of my shows got optioned that way. But finally I got a, a show um, optioned by a well-known producer who everyone was dying to work with. And um, I was very unhappy with that production. I, it was slated to go to Broadway, but it was done wrong and it never made it to Broadway. Um, on the other hand, when I did Charlotte's Suite, I had three offers. I had, when we did the musical theater lab, everyone wanted Ken Waisman to come to their show. Ken Waisman was the producer of Grease and, um, and uh, Agnes of God and some other hits. And he came and he wasn't interested in any of those shows at the musical theater lab. So lucky me, he came to see Charlotte Sweet and he wanted to option that. So I had three producers and uh, Ken Waisman wanted to uh, do what he did with Greece, which he also picked up in original production. Uh, and um, then overhaul with a whole new company and creative team. He proposed that idea to me and there was no way I, if I had the choice, I would turn my back on the people from the showcase because I felt it was their baby as much as mine. And so I turned down Ken Waisman and went with a non-entity producer who, uh, uh, kept the cast together, and uh, but what didn't know how to run it. Um, for we ran for a couple of months, 
And uh, then uh, our weekly grosses were going up and we thought uh, we were going to make it. And, uh, and um, actors were actually got a raise. And the week they got a raise uh, was also um, the week of, um, of, of, of Halloween and people did not go to any shows that weekend. And so the bottom dropped out. And um, so we didn't last as long as we wanted to, but I uh, have never regretted going with the company because for the time we were on, uh, it was a wonderful time. Uh, not everyone loved the show, but the people who loved it were, were, went mad about it. I, I still run into people who are fans of Charlotte Sweet. And uh, of all people, I mean, some of, I got a fan letter um, um, from, uh, from Harold Prince and one from Leonard Cohen and um, the great artist of Broadway, um, Al Hirschfeld uh, saw it and went mad about it and told everyone at the New York Times. And he did two caricatures of it. Hmm. He did one, uh, well, anyway, it, I went to see him and all he wanted to talk about was Charlotte Sweet. Hmm. And, and you know, and when I got his, his, his caricature, it's like one, one of the greatest thrills of all time. I mean, um, I may have said this earlier, Richard Rogers said, there's only, Richard Rogers had a show that was a big hit called Boys from Syracuse. Every night a show, a song called Sing for Your Supper, Supper, Stop the Show. And backstage Richard Rogers said, this is, there's only one other feeling like this, and this one's better. Sure. And I knew what he meant. And when I got the Hirschfeld, it was one of those feelings. I answered you or should I give more detail? Well, I was referring more to, you know, where does somebody now, like, uh, I guess a little bit of what Jeff was saying, um, that, but in terms of where you see the future of Broadway going, uh, you know, like the, the last three shows that you showed, you know, Tina, um, right. you know, you know the, and with these like mega lists of producers, you I know, where there used to be a David Merrick and, you know, a, my hope is that after, after the uh, pandemic, people will pull back and uh, negotiate for more. I mean, the reasons why you take, it takes so many producers is that um, show costs and show tickets are disproportionately uh, spiraling. Um, I was told that the equivalent to a $12 ticket in my time would be, uh, with factoring all the, everything in, it would be 84.80 for these days, but it isn't. It's $125 and, and God knows what. And uh, people have to resort to um, half price and discount tickets. And uh, it's not the same. And um, newcomers, oh, so much of it is luck and so much of it is, is um, being in the right place at the right time. Um, I mean, when Jerry Herman um, had, he'd done one show, Milk and Honey. And then he heard that Derek, David Merrick was producing, uh, was, was auditioning people for Hello Dolly. And, um, and, and Herman was able to write four songs during the weekend. Uh, and he was one of several people and he got the job. Um, the show Kiss of the Spider Woman uh, was part of, um, a program in upstate New York to develop new musicals. Um, and uh, Kiss of the Spider Woman by Kander and Ebb and Terrence McNally was the first show and it got panned. And they were virtually given up on that until Harold Prince um, helped raise the money to take it to London uh, with Chita Vera and that production meshed. Like I told you, um, there are so many elements and without um, going out of town, it's harder and harder. So you find places. Take off. Mm -hmm. off, off Broadway theaters. That's what I did. I got involved with uh, the musical theater lab. Um, I know other people 
um, who will work for theaters and then get their shows done there. Um, or um, they, they just get involved and circulate scripts to nonprofit theaters. And sometimes the script will get picked up. You never know. I'm sorry, am I interrupting anyone? Um, am I giving enough details? I'll give more. No, that answers it, thanks. Okay. Yeah, um, it's hit or miss. Um, uh, you know, um, poor um, um, Larson, the, the, uh, the, the writer of Rent, um, he got involved with various theaters and um, he got his friends to come to see Rent when there were backers in the, uh, the audience and they were um, having readings. And um, that got um, picked up by the right producers. And then it went to a workshop and it got raves. And then after all that poor, um, the poor guy um, died on the opening night of, uh, of Rant. Yes. Judy, you're muted. Yes. Judy Hirschberg, uh, you're muted. Jonathan. Am I, am I unmuted now? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a young woman who grew up in Burlington who uh, is um, started college in New York City and auditioned for a part in the, the revival of The Music Man, which she won. And Music Man was supposed to open uh, this spring. Do you know anything about that or, or uh, how a play like that might come back? It's supposed to come back uh, if the elements allow um, in uh, October or November. The only thing, even worse than COVID what's happened is that uh, it's producer. Um, Scott Rudin is going through a, through a um, bad reputation, expose period. So and, um, the leading lady of one of his other shows, uh, Moulin Rouge just dropped out. She won't turn because of what's happening with Scott Rudin. So, um, you know, the, the breaks are phenomenal. Um, I, um, I had a cousin who came to New York and um, she became part of something called the the American Dance Machine. She was working right away. And when I, try, I met with her for the first time, I said, you better have backup um, plans. And then she got into a revival of West Side Story almost overnight. But I'll be darned, she hasn't worked since. So. You don't know. The draw of the luck, the just yeah. somebody, well, as, I, as I gave you the examples of, um, uh, of Alfred Urey, who was going back to teaching and giving up. Uh, and then he would have never written uh, Driving Miss Daisy. And won, uh, another Tony for Last Night of Ballyhoo and for a parade. And um, John House, I did the seating and John Houseman came in the last night uh, and there were no other offers. And, and thanks to John, John Houseman, Alfred Urey continued. And um, as I said, Annie was a hard luck life. Um, it got very mixed reviews and negative reviews. And then on the last night, um, the producer director, uh, Mike Nichols, he, it was recommended that he go. And um, he loved it and saw the possibilities. Sometimes it's the right critic coming. I know shows where um, one critic helped save it. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it is really Russian roulette. <laughs> I mean. yeah. So Michael wanted to thank you again for taking the time to join us. Uh -huh. And uh, any final questions anyone has before we before we close out? I think it was it was a wonderful wonderful talk. Uh, it's recorded at the temple. Can yeah. you send, can you send the links to that? Yeah. And if possible, you can uh, edit out when I mumble a little bit. <laughs> That's <laughs> not possible. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
And I'd also want to invite if, if folks from Woodmere want to stay on for a couple of minutes. Uh, Sarah, is, is the Zoom room going to be needed right away? I don't know if Sarah is still on. I don't know where Sarah is. I don't know where Sarah is, but um, oh. but um, I thank you too. I thank you very much. And um, so I will and, hang. So I will hang around for a while afterwards. Okay. Very good. Thank you all, Thanks. and hope to see you twice in May. Thank that, you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Michael. Wow, that, that's quite a talk. Oh, I was even better last night. <laughs> Doing the, the, the PowerPoint is, is quite a job when you're trying to also read a script. Uh, you, you got it rolling nicely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I don't see Nancy anymore. I don't know if Sam ever came.